I apologize this morning. My voice is leaving me for some reason. I have a frog in my throat, and, and I can't speak as loudly as I do normally. And uh, to my wife, that's probably a good thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, we'll try to get through this. Today marks the beginning of our journey through the season of the church year, known as Advent. It's a relatively short period of time, approximately four weeks in length, and it culminates in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus, the Christ. Now we all know that the first Advent, or the first coming, occurred some 2,000 years ago. And now, now we look forward with great anticipation to the second advent when he will come again to judge mankind. And this season is a time of preparation for that coming. In fact, the preparations have already begun. Look around you. The church is now adorned in greenery, <coughs> with wreaths being placed on the doors and the advent wreath in place, and the color purple, representing the royalty of Christ, is prevalent throughout the church. A few minutes ago, we blessed and lit the advent wreath which symbolically represents the light of Christ coming into the world to dispel the darkness of sin. Even the form of the wreath being circular, no beginning, no end, it symbolizes the eternity of God and the everlasting life found in Christ. As we light the four candles, one each Sunday, we are spreading the light of Christ throughout the world. The three purple candles, they symbolize the prayer, the penance, the preparatory sacrifices undertaken during this season as we prepare ourselves for his return. The rose-colored candle, it reminds us that his coming is near. And the white candle in the center of the wreath represents the arrival of Christ <coughs> and is lit on Christmas Eve. It's a beautiful and meaningful tradition the Advent wreath. But more, more than the symbolism of the ad, uh, Advent wreath, the season of Advent, the season, is far more important. Throughout the Bible, we are told by Christ himself that at the appointed time, he will return to earth to judge mankind. In Matthew 16, verse 27, it is written, The Son of Man shall come in his glory with his angels. And in Luke 21, verse 27, we read, They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And these are just a sampling of the passages. The point is, that the Holy Scriptures are replete with references to Christ's return to earth. Today, as we celebrate the Mass, each one of us will acknowledge his ultimate return. For example, in today's calling, we pray, Almighty God, Give us grace that in the last day 
when he shall come again. When he shall come again, we may rise to life immortal. In the Nicene Creed, where we just confessed our faith, we said the word, he shall come again to judge both the quick and the dead. And we Christians, we believe this. There is no doubt that he will return and we will experience it. Whether it be this year or a thousand years from now, we will one day stand before our Lord and Savior and give an account of our lives. So, how does one prepare to meet God or his Son, Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing we might do is examine our lives. Where do we stand? right now, at this moment. Have we been weak in certain areas? If you are like me, certainly this is so. And believe me, I try. But at times I fail to be the person Christ would have me to be. And I imagine most of you are the same Perhaps, for example, your faith falters at times, particularly when things are not going so well, they are going badly, and you cry, Lord, where are you? Well, when this happens, you must strive. Strive to renew your faith, knowing that God is with you. He will never abandon you. I once read a definition of faith, and there are many, but this one said that faith is believing in something or someone that you cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot touch, and yet you somehow know it exists. It is there. It is present. And this, you know, is a difficult thing to do. And blessed are they who have such faith and believe in God. As we do our, our self-examination, perhaps we find ourselves lacking in that that personal relationship with God that we all long to have. Well, my friends, it's there. It's there for the taking. All you need to do is talk to God. Talk to Him in prayer. Each Sunday, as we walk through the doors of the church, we kneel and pray silently, thanking God for allowing us another day, another occasion to worship and glorify Him. Well, my friends, do not limit your prayers to praying in church. Pray to God throughout the day at home, at work, in good times and in bad times. Maintain that personal relationship with him. I know throughout my life, I have prayed to God sometimes in critical moments when I really needed his help. And he reached out to me. I remember several years back more specifically in 1995, and I remember it vividly, I learned that someone very near and dear to me had been diagnosed 
with a precancerous condition. It was unexpected. It was a shock to both this woman and to me. In short time, additional tests were completed to determine if this was a full-blown case of cancer or if it were something else. If the results were positive, it would be devastating. And all we could do was wait and pray. I know personally, I prayed incessantly to God to spare this person's life and to not inflict upon her this horrible disease, for she was truly a devout follower of his and had much yet to contribute <coughs> to this life. Well, after several uncertain days of waiting, I was told that the test results had come in. And the doctor's office called and said that he wanted to see this person. I accompanied her to the doctor's office. And when we got there, I had been trying to build her up, cheer her up, telling her that, well, this is probably just a, a, a false alarm. And if she did have the disease, it could probably be treated. Well, to make a long story short, we arrived at the doctor's and were taken into his private office. Now, not an examining room. And to me, the way my mind was working, this was an ominous sign. As the doctor came in, he was not smiling. And the look on his face was somber. And he began to speak. I received the results of the tests. I have looked them over. And at this point, I was dreading to hear the words that would follow. But he continued, your wife, Bernadine, does not does not have cancer. The relief was incredible. We had turned to God, and he responded. So I, we, we know the importance of prayer. that personal relationship with God. <clears throat> but back to our self-examination, perhaps you realize that you have not been living in accordance with his commandments, particularly to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. When Christ returns, you must be able to answer yes to the following questions. Were you my friend when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was a stranger, when I was naked, when I was sick? or when I was in prison. And in your logic, you might answer, no. How could I, Lord? For I was not living when you walked the earth. 
but my dear, dear friends. Jesus told us in Matthew 25, verse 40, that which you do to the least of mine, you do also to me. From that perspective, are you able to answer yes? Have you aided and assisted those in need, those with whom you did live on earth? If so, you have led a life in Christ, and your reward awaits you. But if you are like most of us, we have not always done God's will, and we have fallen short. But to be sure, God gives us a second chance. He tells us, if you have sinned, if you have failed to do my bidding, come to me with a contrite heart. Confess your sins. Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And if you are truly repentant, he will forgive you your sins. The key words here are with the contrite heart. And if you are truly repentant. And finally, in preparing ourselves during this Advent season, we must partake of the Holy Communion, the Dominical Sacrament that Christ has told us is necessary for our salvation. As we come to this altar rail this morning and receive his most precious body and blood, he becomes one with us and we with him. He cleanses our soul and he washes our sins with his blood. He fortifies and nourishes us with his body and we are born anew. <clears throat> so my brothers and sisters in Christ, as we proceed through the second Advent season, prepare yourself for his coming. For as we are told in Mark 13, verse 32 and 37, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And in our epistle today, we are told the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So do not be found wanting or sleeping when he returns. As we patiently await his second advent, let us not only look for his return, the return of Christ in the future, let us look for the return of Christ in our hearts today, now, this instant. Now this sentiment has been expressed in many ways, but perhaps never better than expressed in Philip Brooks' familiar carol, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sins and enter in. Be born in us today. Amen.